Namaste and welcome to Detours with me Anuradha Goyal where I talk to some very interesting personalities about journeys of all kinds. So today we have uh, Shri Sanjay Dharwadekar uh, the author of Diamond in my palm which very interestingly speaks about the journey of 12 most famous historical diamonds in the world so sanjay ji namaste and welcome to detours namaste uh, so first of all tell us something about yourself and how did you first came to know of these diamonds anuradha ji thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you on this subject i uh, have had the good fortune of working in india then i spent a long stint in south africa and now i am in i am in the netherlands and in south africa the first time i became aware of the deep history and stories about diamonds because south africa uh, is another country which has a wealth of diamond mining for the last few hundred years but what was interesting is that diamonds were found in south africa in 1866 i believe not before that not before that there were some diamonds found in brazil in 1700s mm-hmm. but before that it was only india which produced diamonds so that was uh, something which immediately caught my eye mm-hmm. and then i did a bit of uh, study of where these diamond mines were located and you always heard of them being referred to as the golconda mines so they were obviously somewhere near hyderabad mm-hmm. but after studying a bit of the history of the various locations mm-hmm. they could have been in that area around um, uh, amravati amravati and then i was able to establish that it was probably uh, places on either side of vijayawada they were known as paritala and poluru mm-hmm. these were the two centers which seem to be the most likely places where these ancient uh, diamond mines existed mm-hmm. so it was actually the riverine source of the krishna okay so you know they traveled along the krishna river in the alluvium mm-hmm. and this is where they kind of settled in the river beds and that is where they were uh, Uh, that, is, that is very interesting because uh, one of the most famous diamond also is connected to Lord Krishna, Shri Krishna. Yes. Right. Uh, so tell us, uh, you've studied these twelve diamonds in oh. detail. So where are these diamonds right now in the world? Yes. So I again then set out to discover which are the most famous diamonds, and I found that every major uh, superpower country today. has given the pride of a place of its history in a diamond related to that country mm-hmm. so of course the most famous one and most commonly known is the kohinoor mm-hmm. which is now part of the crown jewels of the united kingdom and it is displayed at the tower of london and we indians pay a hefty price to just see it yes now we pay a price to go and see it but similarly if you went to the us their most famous diamond the hope uh, diamond which is at the smithsonian mm-hmm. again has an indian uh, uh, origin mm-hmm. and uh, if you went to the kremlin mm-hmm. there are two diamonds there the mm-hmm. orlov mm-hmm. which became uh, a little uh, extraordinarily famous because that was the diamond with which catherine the great was wooed Mm-hmm. you know the, okay. her yeah. lover yeah. gave it to her mm-hmm. and she refused the lover but kept okay. the diamond <laughs> okay and uh, uh, then there is also the shah diamond mm-hmm. similarly there are uh, uh, there is a diamond in the tokapi palace because okay. the ottomans mm-hmm. also uh, you know yearned to possess one of these great indian diamonds and they have them mm-hmm. and similarly in tehran okay there are only two diamonds out of these 12 mm-hmm. which do not have a uh, which are not in a museum mm-hmm. or in are not public property mm-hmm. one is privately owned in the us mm-hmm. and the other the location is not known okay 
So you know, these, it is owned secretly by somebody. So you can actually travel around the world if you travel for these diamonds. Yes, if you went to about 10 locations, mm -hmm. you can actually get and to see all these diamonds. Yeah, which ranges from US to Russia. Yes. So you're pretty much covering yes. all the latitudes. So next time if you say planned a trip to go to Moscow, London, Washington, Tehran and Istanbul, Mm -hmm. You can probably see seven or eight of these diamonds. But they are all pretty much in the northern hemisphere. Yes. Pretty much. Pretty much. Very right. right. So, uh, uh, you know, so you're saying like uh, Amravati or the, uh, you know, the banks of Krishna River were really the fountainhead from where these diamonds kind of sprinkled around the world. Uh, now, how did these people come to know of these diamonds, especially in, in, in medieval times or ancient times? How did the world know about these diamonds? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And I think the bulk of the research which I had to do to write this book was trying to discover how the information or the news about these diamonds spread and uh, uh, then what effort people put because those days it was a very big effort coming from Europe to yes. traveling from Europe to India mm -hmm. and if I can give one example sure. now is uh, what uh, ended up as the Hope Diamond in the Smithsonian mm -hmm. uh, before that it was obtained by the French mm -hmm. and at that time it was known as the Tavernier Blue Mm -hmm. It is a blue, uh, blue tinted diamond mm -hmm. and why it was known as the Tavernier Blue was uh, you would be aware that Tavernier was a traveler. Yes. You can see his statue in the Lake Geneva still yes. there. And he traveled six times to India mm -hmm. and you can almost get the feel because his these travels are very well documented Yes. that he virtually traveled to seek these diamonds. Oh, so he was not traveling to explore India, he was traveling to obtain these diamonds. You can actually see that uh, when you look at it up close, mm -hmm. because one of his, uh, uh, you know, the literally one section of his travel descriptions mm -hmm. is detailed sketches of these diamonds, which mm -hmm. were, in fact, that is the longest living record of images, you know, on paper of these uh, great diamonds. So where would ha he get these sketches or did he create those sketches? He created those sketches and in the book of course I have made a, um, uh, you know, without revealing too much of the plot because mm -hmm. you must read the book, yes, it has got yes. interesting uh, yes. facts like this. But uh, I, I have made the joke that he made uh, these sketches in so much detail because he wanted to make fake imitations of these diamonds too. That's a possibility. Yes. That's a possibility. So, uh, but and then it happens that see Tavernier traveled. It, it used to take him two years to reach India. Mm -hmm. In order to take up these journeys, he obviously had information before. Right. And I was able to trace the likely person who gave him the information who traveled to India during about a hundred years before which mm -hmm. was during Akbar's time. Emperor Somebody Akbar's must have time. been funding his travels? His uh, his travels were actually funded by the king of by the Bourbons okay. and uh, by, by you know by then the Bourbon dynasty was well entrenched in uh, Paris mm -hmm. and one of the earlier Bourbons mm -hmm. had traveled it was Jean Philippe mm -hmm. he had traveled to uh, uh, India mm -hmm. and in fact because of his kind of semi royal lineage mm -hmm. he actually gained uh, entry to Emperor Akbar's court how did he do that because uh, he uh, courted a lady called Julia mm -hmm. who was the sister of Miriam who married uh, Akbar. Akbar. So okay. it is likely that Jean-Philippe was a, what in India we call a co-brother-in-law of right. uh, uh, Akbar. And he had access to the Mughal treasury. Mm -hmm. There are known, uh, uh, you know, kind of transactions of mm -hmm. uh, how he promoted a bit of French trade. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there are records of his uh, discussions with Todermal, for example, who was Emperor Akbar's, Akbar's uh, finance, uh, you right, know, treasury right, minister. Right, right. So, uh, you know, all this rich uh, material is there. And sorry for, uh, you know, 
another extrapolation. Mm -hmm. This was also the time, if you remember, the Jesuit priests traveled to India. Right. And they had the famous dialogues in Fatehpur Sikri for the inter-faith uh, dialogues. dialogues. Okay. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So another uh, brother-in-law of his mm -hmm. was actually the translator, was the interpreter between the uh, missionaries and the... <laughs> so the diamonds were literally traveling within the family. Family. Yes. In a way, yes. which the connections may not be very obvious. Uh, your book is titled uh, Diamond in My Palm. Yes. So where does that title come from? That's very interesting. Uh, thanks for asking this question. The title of the book, it comes from a beautiful poem written by R. Parthasarthi which is titled Speaking of Places mm -hmm. and I will, if you don't mind, I'll quote a please, small uh, please read it uh, section of this mm -hmm. and to give you the background, uh, this poem is about Sri Rangam, the famous temple, the famous Hindu temple in on the island of the, Ka in the Kaveri near okay. Trichy okay. and that used to have the Vishnu, the Shesha reclining Shai Vishnu, Vishnu. yeah had these, uh, what later became the Orla of Diamond okay. as part of that idol. Oh, okay. So, uh, I'll just, now this poem, in that context you will understand. It right. says, I quote, I cannot stop thinking of Sri Rangam. I roll the name on the tongue for comfort. I know one day I shall arrive there. Mm -hmm. Her towers, a constellation of beryl, pearl and coral. Didn't the Romans long ago travel this way? I step into the waters of the Kaveri, turn its diamond in my palm. Wow. Thank you so much for reading that for us. And in fact, Sri Rangam continues to be uh, one of the biggest living Hindu temples even today. Yes. You know, um, so, uh, and yes, again, uh, Vishnu connection actually. <laughs> so, yes. interesting. Uh, so, I want to ask you, were there any trade links between, uh, there were any trade links in the ancient times uh, between diamond traders across the world? Uh, that is uh, another aspect which I tried to uh, uh, discover, but I think uh, uh, that is maybe I will use that as a uh, uh, title, uh, as a subject of another book because it's a very big title. Mm -hmm. But I'll just give you uh, an idea. Uh, the There are at least two known communities mm -hmm. from among the Jews and among the Indian uh, Jain community mm -hmm. which have dealt in diamonds for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I have been able to trace uh, them back to at least the 10th century AD. Okay. Uh, where there have been, um, you know, active trade of uh, uh, stones, for example. And a global trade. And a global trade. And as the poem mm -hmm. just highlights, mm -hmm. there was definitely a connection even with the Roman Empire, even the Romans. Yes. yes. So, Tamil Nadu coast has, yes. uh, uh, we've discovered uh, uh, Roman coins uh, at least 2000 years yes. ago. So. And so did the Romans land up at Machli Patnam, yes. which is the uh, where the mouth of the delta of the Krishna, right? And uh, you know that became a center and right. connection for all this. Uh, right. So there, you're saying there are two uh, communities which have been trading in diamonds since time immemorial, and they continue to be trading. Yes. Uh, so uh, do you think this trade could have kind of uh, perpetuated the popularity of these big diamonds which potentially were always with the rulers uh, I should uh, I should suspect that as well mm -hmm. uh, because obviously these stories mm -hmm. were there mm -hmm. and you know there are even records of uh, these diamonds being mentioned in these uh, Senate in the Roman Senate mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, there are these precious stones from India mm -hmm. uh, you find their reference in the other mm -hmm. medieval records right. and the first known uh, traveler mm -hmm. who probably again came looking for the diamonds mm -hmm. was a Jew mm -hmm. from uh, Germany from Ratisbon mm -hmm. and he seemed to have elaborate records of uh, diamonds and there is 
a one uh, particular story which uh, does not get fully verified mm -hmm. but it's a very interesting story and that is of a diamond called the briolet of india mm -hmm. which if the stories are to be believed was the first diamond to have come out of india mm -hmm. which was as early as the 10th century mm -hmm. and as the story goes this was the diamond which was carried by richard the lionheart okay on the third crusade Okay. When you know the first two crusades, the Europeans, the Christians lost quite heavily, mm -hmm. but Richard the Lionheart was able to retrieve some lost ground, mm -hmm. and at least he made a treaty mm -hmm. with Saladin, as we mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. which allowed Christians entry into Babylon for perpetuity. Okay. So the little point I make in the story was because he exchanged the briolet of India with. Saladin, because after that the Briolet of India came into uh, Arabic hands for okay. some centuries. So, is there are there any myths or beliefs or superstitions or uh, any of that associated with these diamonds? Very heavy. In fact, the diamonds are somehow made to look very unlucky and have yes you know curse that whoever possesses and especially the big diamonds the kohinoor yes so the kohinoor has this famous uh, story about whoever possessed it would lose his kingdom right but apparently somewhere along the line they discovered that if the diamond was in the possession of the queen or mm -hmm. a woman mm -hmm. then it does not bring bad luck okay. and for at least from the time of humayun mm -hmm. up to the uh, much later time mm -hmm. the kohinoor used to be in the possession of the mughal queens oh in fact even uh, aurangzeb never held never touched the kohinoor mm -hmm. but he would leave it with his daughter who was a, a poet or his wife yeah and finally it was mohammad shah rangile mm -hmm. who made the very rash mistake of taking back possession of the diamond and used to wear it in his um, turban mm -hmm. and he lost it to nadir shah in uh, 1739 and then nadir shah took it nadir shah took it and can you believe it nadir shah also lived for just 10 years after that mm -hmm. and that is how the kohinoor then traveled back because mm -hmm. it was uh, you see that was the fate of these diamonds they were either used by uh lovers to you know who if important queen or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they were used as ransom mm -hmm. they were used as treaties you yeah. know for exchange a show of strength yes and of course a show of strength but the kohinoor then saved humayun's life mm -hmm. it saved nadir shah's um, uh, grandson's life mm -hmm. and in exchange of which he gave it to ahmed shah abdali mm -hmm. and so on and so forth Mm -hmm. till till uh, temporarily the kohinoor of course came back to ranjit singh uh, maharaja ranjit singh and then the seven year old dulip singh mm -hmm. had to you know uh, make a show of it as a gift to queen victoria right and in exchange for which his life was spared as they say and so at the moment uh, wherever it is people mm -hmm. are prospering wherever these diamonds are yes and as you will carefully see that mm -hmm. the british royalty also uses the diamond only when there is a queen or it's made mm. to be looked as a part of the jewelry, jewelry of the queen mother never right. of the king ha huh. right so you know these are uh, very interesting uh, yeah. so tell us where were the diamond trading hubs in the past and where are they now that's another interesting question certainly uh places like machli patnam mm -hmm. and hyderabad mm -hmm. uh had a lot of diamond trade because you can go back to at least the uh, you know times of uh, the kakatiya rulers for example right. 11 12 Varangal, 13th century Kakati. warangal mm -hmm. so you know there was a lot of diamond trade there mm -hmm. and in uh, europe mm -hmm. uh, strangely there were lot of diamonds there so you get the feeling that there was a kind of uh, fairly intense trade between india and the Any european powers in particular areas in europe uh, ratisbon it's a small mm -hmm. place in germany mm -hmm. where i have found were a lot of records of uh, diamonds. diamonds and it was again a particular jewish community mm. there so that gives me an idea that uh, the jews have been in this business for a very long time at least 10 centuries okay 
and uh, uh, you know uh, how are indians doing in diamond trade today are there any famous diamond traders jewelry designers uh, who are dominating the diamond scene today that's again a very interesting question as uh, many of you are familiar now probably antwerp is the biggest uh, center for diamond trade right in today's uh, uh, you know diamond business before this there was a lot of diamond trade being done at amsterdam and just after the second world war it moved temporarily to paris mm mm-hmm. so you know these three places have a lot of uh, the big diamond jewelers mm-hmm. and the people who cut you know mm-hmm. the polished and shaped these diamonds mm-hmm. for example after uh, the kohinoor was taken by uh, queen victoria mm-hmm. uh, prince albert her mm-hmm. consort mm-hmm. Uh, called in the best uh, diamond cutters from mm-hmm. Amsterdam mm-hmm. and they took about 38 days to mm-hmm. give the kohinoor its mm-hmm. present shape mm-hmm. so you know these are some of the histories but what one incident or one particular person i would like to mention. really highlight mm-hmm. and mention is uh, much of the 50s 60s 70s and 80s mm-hmm. of the 20th century the one of the leading diamond traders was an american called harry winston mm mm-hmm. and um, you know his famous showroom is there on 5th uh, avenue in uh, new york mm-hmm. but for those 40 years when he was on the top of the diamond trade and you know he is the person who made all those famous diamonds for richard burton and mm-hmm. elizabeth taylor for all the rich families in mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. us His designer was an Indian by the name of Ambaji Shinde. Hmm, interesting. Yes. So, uh, whatever you see related with diamond jewelry today, in mm-hmm. fact, the very delicate design of the clasps, mm-hmm. you know, which which make the diamond jewelry look so, you know, sparkling. Spa- you know, the diamond gets the prominence, right? And not the way it is embedded right, or right, held in the right. in a you know in the earring or in the chain yeah. that particular invention is attributed to ambaji sen shinde oh and personally his life was a lonely one because harry winston said he must move to new york mm-hmm. and his family refused to move with him mm-hmm. so you know he lived the usual lonely cold and clammy life of in, <laughs> of an indian expatriate <laughs> in new york for i believe 30 or 40 years great so i am sure this will make an amazing read uh, diamond in my palm uh, you know the fascinating journey of diamonds from india to the world um, uh, i don't know if they will ever come back <laughs> i hope they do uh, so tell us um, as a writer let me talk to the writer in you so what were your big challenges and uh, or maybe some of the big discoveries while researching for this book I think the big challenges were that it seemed this was like a blind spot in Indian history. Mm-hmm. I think it is important enough mm-hmm. because it, it is it you know takes you across such a wide span of Indian history. Right. So as my book again, I'm revealing mm-hmm. a kind of mm-hmm. uh, not a secret but mm-hmm. an important point that. probably it was the same diamonds mm-hmm. which were held by lord krishna for arjun mm-hmm. in the battlefield of kurukshetra oh. because the uh, legend of the samantak mani mm-hmm. is uh, you know you can actually trace back or virtually trace back many of the incidents in the lives of these diamonds to what is described there oh, okay. for example when the puranas were written mm-hmm. you can almost feel that it was for the same stone uh so, so you can re- literally trace that the uh, the stories of these diamonds are repeating themselves yes. over in different eras yes that, that is that is I very think. interesting so the diamonds see many lifetimes in one lifetime absolutely and as one of the reviewers has stated that mm. it brings the contrast between the uh, long life of the diamonds and the mortality of human beings you know who try yes. to yes <coughs> yes yes in fact most of the things are long live longer than human beings okay so tell us what is the next work that you are working on what is it that you are going to be going to see from your pen next uh, well it has been quite exhausting writing this particular novel because mm-hmm. it took about 7 mm-hmm. uh, years of uh, research and writing and mm-hmm. it was my first uh, novel so mm-hmm. you know it took that much extra effort to mm-hmm. try and uh, make it good 
but now uh, last five years I have been uh, uh, living in the Netherlands in mm -hmm. a little university town called Utrecht mm -hmm. and my topic of my next novel uh, it's going to be titled at least tentatively The Philosopher's Mistress mm -hmm. and uh, you would have heard of the famous uh, uh, French philosopher who's you know a cornerstone of enlightenment mm -hmm. René Descartes right. and René Descartes uh, lived at around the same time when Galileo was being persecuted for example so he came to Utrecht and that is where he wrote many of his big philosophical treatises okay and ironically he was a quite a, a man a brahmachari mm -hmm. he never married mm -hmm. but he had only one uh, mistress uh, mm -hmm. throughout briefly and it is suspected that she was Indian ah. <laughs> so, uh, he lived very briefly with her, but they had a child. The child died very soon after childbirth. Mm -hmm. So, that is what I am going to use as, uh, as a, a pivot, for, pivot for the story. And what I have used is because René Descartes was obviously aware of Indian uh, mathematicians before like Aryabhat and others. Mm -hmm. So, the fictional part of that story is that it was this Indian mistress who brought him all that knowledge. That's very interesting and thank you for uh, choosing subjects which most of us uh, probably overlook. Uh, you know, we've all heard of these diamonds, we've probably uh, seen them during our travels, uh, but we've not really dived into the history and actually realized that they probably come from our homeland. Uh, and also, you know, uh, to me, diamonds are also uh, an aspect of our trade, not just uh, heritage, but trade, our mining our uh, links with the world, uh, the global world. So it's a very, very interesting uh, aspect. So I'm really looking forward to reading your book and also the next books that you write because uh, uh, this is a very unusual uh, way to look at the history at very different lens. Uh, literally, you're looking at the history through the diamonds. So that's very interesting. Thank you so much, Sanjay ji. And really look forward to reading you, your book and wish you all the best for this one and all the next books that you write. Thank you, Anuradha ji, for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Detours. You can also join us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is InDetails, I-N-D-I-T-A-L-E-S. See you soon.